Welcome back to the Morning Brew. We're being joined by Dr. Keegan Bagan, who's the PRO of the Toronto Tobago Medical Association. We are just going to discuss some concerns that will arise or come up again because the Delta variant has been confirmed in Trinidad and Tobago. Good morning, Dr. Bagan. How are you doing? Hi, morning. I'm doing all right. I mean, I know our medical personnel and frontline staff, such as yourself, are really at your limit. How worrying uh, is the confirmation that the Delta variant of COVID-19 is here in Trinidad and Tobago to you? Um, it, it is a significant worry. It is something um, that we were looking out for and we were concerned when it comes um, rather than an if, because uh, as you could see, it has been spreading across the entire world before arriving here in Trinidad. Um, it's, uh, I think the last estimate was about 142 countries have confirmed Delta variant present. So yeah. it is something that we had to prepare for. And again, that's why all the months and all the efforts pushed towards vaccination drives, pushed towards um, ensuring everyone is accustomed wearing their face masks and comfortable using um, the face masks, hand sanitizing, social distancing everywhere. Because as we move forward, we're going to have to face not only the Delta variant, but any other variants that come along over the, the next few months or years. When we say that the when they say that the Delta variant is more transmissible, what does that mean? Does that mean that we have to to adjust the current public health guidelines? Stand six feet apart from someone, um, stand, wash your hands, wear a mask, social distance. Is it that those are not necessarily sufficient against Delta? No, actually, those still are exactly what you need to do and sufficient by. Um, what they mean when they say more transmissible, they not in all diseases, you know exactly why the transmission rate goes up. It takes a little while to, to, to study to figure out exactly why the transmissible rate is increased. But what it means is where the original virus may, um, each, each infected person might spread to say two or three people where the Delta variant each infected person might now spread to about four or five people. So there's an increase in the number of potential persons spread. And that is in a population who have no immunity to the virus itself. So again, vaccinations will change that. Um, the same social distancing, the same mask wearing, the same washing hands also uh, change that as well. So it's not that you need to change those things, it just means that we have to be particular about uh, making sure that we still do it. Yeah, we can't slip at all. Now is not the time um, no. for slippage. Uh, has, has the arrival of Delta complicated the clinical process for doctors in terms of treating patients in Trinidad and Tobago? Not, not exactly. It, the, it would complicate from the perspective of vigilance. It, it complicates it from um, every Delta variant. We want to be additionally cautious um, about who those contacts are. Um, any of those persons, if they become sick, we want to be vigilant again about their quarantine and so on. So, and, and it is also more um, troubling in the sense that if a person is carrying a Delta variant and then they don't follow the instructions, they don't stick to the quarantine or they, they find themselves still interacting with other persons, then it is even more likely that they will get someone else infected. So the work increases because of the, the vigilance has to increase in how we manage them, but the method and the criteria and all the actual things we have to do doesn't change. Now, this has been a, quite a few months of a lot of people getting a really intensive um, but yet superficial understanding of how viruses work, how vaccines work, um, how, vir how vaccines are developed, and actually how viruses, you know, th their job is to replicate, their job is to spread. So, and COVID has been doing that very well, and, and we are kind of struggling to prevent it from doing that. But one of the things, and, and I'm using the opportunity that you're here to kind of reinforce basic information because this has a lot been very complicated for the public to understand. But one of the things that might be of concern to 
some members of the public, is that you require a negative PCR test to enter Trinidad and Tobago. Yet these two persons who were unvaccinated tested positive within seven days of their quarantine. Can we talk about why, uh, you know, how, how they tested negative, but clearly still had the virus um, and then tested positive so shortly after? Can we, can we uh, get some clarity as to how the vac the, this particular virus works? Sure. Um, so, so actually, how it works, and that—that that is why the the days and the times that that we use are what we use. So, for example, the qu the quarantine period to, is 14 days to what someone who has a potential exposure. So, a person who could be exposed to the virus today uh, and contract it. So, it is they they have taken it. It's in their body. They are infected with it but it may take as much as 14 days before they test positive. The original virus, what we would call the, the, the Wuhan strain, um, that virus took on average, um, the median time was between five to nine days. So that's why we would say seven is a reasonable average. But again, that's why we use 14 days because early data showed that the longest time was 12. So what it means, just like any other virus, you could get the virus today and feel well and not be sick, but still have it. And it will take, in this case, as much as 14 days it can take before you test positive or become symptomatic. And that's why we watch for 14 days. So even someone entering the country with a negative test, they can still have the virus. They could have been exposed prior to the negative test they could be exposed after the negative test before they land. And that's why we need that 14 days to observe and make sure that the time period passes when they could show up as positive or show up with symptoms. And that's why that 14 days imp is important. After you get the virus, the 20 days that we use for quarantine is because once you have the virus now, that first 10 to 14 days after having the virus is usually the worst period in terms of the illness and the symptoms and your ability to transmit the virus to others. And the 20 days is sort of that maximum limit where even a person who is ill for other reasons, so they have chronic disease or they have a particularly severe case of the virus, um, the data showed that 20 days on average, they, they still can spread the virus. Hence, our protocols for a minimum of 20 days if you contract the virus. So, so all the days and the times that, that, that is chosen um, is not exactly arbitrary. And that is why um, some persons feel, uh, you know, sometimes, especially when they have a mild course of the disease, they feel, you know, it's, uh, they've been unfairly treated to be kept at home for so long in quarantine. But it is really to ensure that we have that maximum time periods that we could control spreading to anyone else. And how, what's the role of vaccine, vaccines in this, uh, in, in combating Delta? Because I know the vaccines don't necessarily prevent you from getting ill. Um, and there's some concern that some of the vaccines aren't as effective against the Delta variant. So, so how, how are we to process the vaccines that we have here, especially with confirmation that Delta, you know, we have at least two confirmed cases of, of the Delta variant in Trinidad and Tobago, two isolate, isolated cases, let me at least say that. Sure. Um, you're right. Right now, the two cases that we identify have been identified on entry and isolated. So we expect that they, that should contain that spread, but um, I, I usually expect in any situation, if you find something, um, you've you've only found the tip of the iceberg, and we have to make sure that we we are aware that there there's potential for more. So we have to be careful. Um, but the vaccine, the reason the, the vaccines are so important, um, every vaccine has all these different efficacy rates, uh, and everybody is sort of. Um, arguing over which vaccine based on efficacy. But at the end of the day, the virus itself keeps changing. So none of those efficacies apply sort of forever or, or universally. Um, for example, the irony is that the Sinopharm vaccine, um, parts of Asia is noting in their data that the Sinopharm has been um, more effective 
against the Delta variant than the AstraZeneca, I think they, they did the comparison against. But it showed that there was an increased e efficacy. But what I wanna give you as an example to see why vaccination is so important and it doesn't matter which one. All the vaccines that we're arguing about from Sinopharm up have anywhere between 79%, which is um, Sinopharm's rate, 84, which is AstraZeneca, um, 92, 94, 95, those are like the Pfizer and the Moderna. But let's take an example of influenza vaccines, which we use every year to fight the, the, in, the flu. Yes. And yeah. from year to year, it varies because the, the virus, the influenza virus mutates all the time. And many times our efficacy rate on the influenza vaccine is 50 to 60% far less than all these other COVID vaccines we're talking about. But picture a 50% efficacy rate. <clears throat> and two people have the vaccine and they're surrounded by persons with, with COVID. One out of those two people, even with the vaccine, gonna get it because there's a 50% efficacy rate. But if, that, if one person in the middle now, instead of being surrounded by COVID positive patients, they're surrounded by one ring of vaccinated persons. Their, not, their chance of getting it now is 50% times 50%. So they now go down to one in four chance of getting it. You add another ring of vaccinated persons around that same ring, then it goes down to one, um, sorry, one in eight percent, right? So just those three circles, you went from a 50% efficacy rate to uh, 80, um, 83 percent efficacy rate, right? So, and that is something at 50 percent. So that's why we need to to forget these ideas of what the efficacy is and just think about getting vaccinated because every vaccine is a layer of protection. So your vaccine is one layer, your mask is another layer, your social distance is, an, is another layer, your friends who vaccinated is another layer, their friends who vaccinated is another layer. So all of these things, these things are additional layers of protection, and we need to get as much layers on as possible so that any new variant, whether it's Delta or the other variants coming up, that we have more and more layers of protection on each and every one of us, and that is how we'll prevent it from spreading. Dr. Bagan, we have two confirmed cases of the Delta variant in Trinidad and Tobago, but we don't test everyone who's positive. So we don't gene sequence everyone who's possible, positive. So it's entirely possible that we have persons who already have Delta circulating in Trinidad and Tobago. What I wanted to ask is, why don't we test everyone? Or how do we select samples for testing? Are you able to explain that to us? Sure. Um but for one, we, we, we really can't run the test because it is extremely expensive to, to run that test on everyone. And um, if they invest all the resources in doing that gene sequencing, then we wouldn't have any resources to keep the ICUs running or the medications available, you know, because gene sequencing is actually an extraordinarily expensive um, aspect of testing. So what, what we, the approach we take really is sampling, which is, um, just as effective. I mean, that's why studies are designed and so on, because it, it doesn't make sense to test every single individual when you could take smaller samples and be able to calculate the answer from there. So what they do is they take random samples of um, local tests being done, and then what they do is um, they, they, they do all the sequencing for persons arriving in the country. So that way, you know that if someone is, is coming into the country, you're still looking to see if they are importing some unusual variant or something different. Um, but the sampling within the local population still gives us a, a picture and we could ex extrapolate from the sample whether there's more present in the population. So I would say from that local sampling, there isn't enough to suggest that we have it rampant in the country or, or within local spread, but it doesn't deny that it can have some um, cases there amid the local spread, and we're not gonna know just yet, because like with all sampling, 
um, processes, you, you get to know when the tip of the iceberg it becomes visible. But what's brewing underneath the water, you don't see till, till much later. So we have, we, we are steadily trying to get more members of the population um, vaccinated. We, you know, the government has this ambitious plan to reach, I think, over 600,000 by the end of September, which I think is about 60%. Um, mm -hmm. My math is terrible, so just, you know. Um, but the virus likes to mutate. And I'm wondering about the relationship of unvaccinated and vaccinated. Like, how does vaccination stop or halt that mutation, mutation process? Or is there a risk that if we continue to have such a high level of unvaccinated people, that the virus can um, mutate even in the vaccinated population? And if that is a cause for concern, because this virus um, really has been very unpredictable. Sure. So the, what happens, so when you get sick with, with COVID or any virus, but when you get sick with it, the virus replicates inside your body. So it infects as many cells as it can, and each cell makes millions and millions and millions of copies of the virus. So every copy is just like, I mean, is, is just like genetics with people. Every generation is a mix of the um, parents from before, right? and subsequent generations, you, you change over time, right? And that, that's how you get variation. Um, so the virus though, doing millions of generations inside each and every infected person. That's why mutations are something you see so quickly. So the more people who can get infected means that each person it becomes a Petri dish to allow the virus to mutate. So the more available for a pool for that means that the virus will continue jumping between those people, replicating many, many, many times and slowly um, developing another variant again versus the vaccinated who, those, those who get vaccinated, one less likely to get the infection, which means you put sort of a stop on that virus ability to, to replicate or find a host where it could replicate and change over time. But also, even if you do get sick, you, you actually reduce your tra um, the severity of the illness and your body has an earlier immune response. And you're also less likely to spread it to someone else because you're gonna recover faster. So all of those prevents that virus, even if you're vaccinated and you get it, from having the opportunity to, to create mutations that could spread. So the vaccinated population is what is, is going to have to protect the unvaccinated population, but that could only work if the unvaccinated pool is so small. So for example, our other virus targets for vaccination, things like measles and, and well, I wouldn't use polio. We, we, actively eradicated. trying to eradicate polio <laughs> yeah yeah essentially but but things like the measles and so on we, we try to get our vaccination numbers above 96 percent 96 percent of our population at minimum and we we typically year on year on surpass our targets with it so um we attempt to achieve that higher level of vaccinations to ensure that there is no pool there is no reservoir where the virus could spread in this country for something like measles. So when we attempt to achieve with COVID 60 and 70%, these are, these are really min, um, minimal herd immunity points. So they aren't really that stage where you could have enough vaccinated to stop variations and stop mutations because there's still enough pool of persons for the virus to spread and mutate within. So. Although we have those targets, we need to, over time, hit it and exceed it, just like we do with all our other vaccination programs in the country. I, and one more question, and I'm asking this because after the show on Wednesday, so after the morning brew, I was listening to the radio to Slam 100, and I heard my colleagues, Blaze and Miles, really trying to explain to this guy, um, this caller, the difference between the immunity you get from having had COVID-19 and surviving it, 
as opposed to the immunity you get from the various vaccines. Can you explain why even though I have had COVID-19 recovered, I should still get a vaccine when it's safe for me to do so? Why doesn't my natural immunity from having had the real virus match or even surpass having a vaccine? Sure. Um, I I've had that same argument with, with persons before as well, so that's why. Um, I'm Listen, I'm so grateful to have you on the show this morning. You have been explaining all of these things. If you are not teaching at UE's um, Faculty of Medica Medicine, they need to call you immediately after this interview. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, I love to teach because that's what we do with our patients. Every day is, is teaching, really. Um, but, but yeah, it's so. Um, so the issue with that, right, is that you get infected with the virus, but the, we conceptualize it as the real virus versus not. But there's no such thing. You got infected, or any person, any person got infected with a version, a mutation of the COVID-19 virus. The mutation may not have been enough to be an entire new variant, but it's a mutation of it. So when your immune system mounts a response and learns to fight it, um, there's no predictable guarantee of what your immune system learned to fight. But your immune system learned to fight the exact mutation that you got. Sometimes that works out well, that your immune system learned generalized parts of the virus, so other mutations, you still easily fight it off. But sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it learns very specific antibodies to the exact mutation you got. So therefore, you're very much immune to the exact same mutation, but that mutation after it was infected in you is gone because it changed so much while it was in that person and everybody else who gets infected, it changes so much. And then again, when it changes that drastically that an, it evolves to a new variant, then your natural immunity still is no longer guaranteed to have any effect against the variant. Now the difference with a vaccine what the vaccine development process looks like is that you're trying to create um, a primer to train your immune system. But we look at the genetic material and we look at the virus as a whole, and then we target the parts of the virus that is definitely common and, and will have little change from mutation to mutation or over variants it should have um, small changes only, and we make sure that we develop the vaccine to train your immune system to those targeted aspects of the virus. Therefore, one vaccine will give your immune system training against multiple mutations or multiple presentations of the same virus versus natural immunity, which only gave you the training against the exact one that you got. It's also um, influenza is an excellent example for why this is an issue because every year we have to do an influenza vaccine because the influenza virus also mutates a lot. The vaccine targets specific for influenza. Um, we look at the H and N um, uh, target sites uh, on the surface uh, and that's how we name the virus as well as how we um, choose to target the virus because those are sort of commonalities. Whereas when you get the flu naturally, there'll be all these other surface things that your body will learn to fight. And then a few months later, you could still get the flu <laughs> because some other variation of flu or some other strain will not carry the exact same markers. You see, and that's why every year we still have to do the influenza vaccine. So the concept is the same. Your natural immunity really does protect you, but only from the specific version that you got. So there isn't a real versus an unreal. Everybody gets their own version. But the, the vaccine tries to take the commonalities across all versions to train you to fight that commonality rather than anything that might be specific to one alone. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Keegan Bagan, for that thorough explanation of all the complexities of this situation. Because, you know, a lot of the fear is, is and, and, and confusion is driven by the fact that we just don't know and we don't understand how to process this information. So we're so grateful to have you on the show um, to bring clarity. And like I said, that last question I heard being discussed on the radio. My colleagues did a fantastic okay. job, but um, they needed the okay. additional information. No, and that's hopefully, fine, but the more, the more we speak spread the, the information, the, be the better for our population. Exactly. So listen, thank you so much for coming on the show. Have a fantastic day to our watching, viewing public. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back and discuss climate change because within the past few weeks, we've been having very, very serious flooding with disastrous results. So we need to start having a climate change conversation in Trinidad and Tobago immediately.